Praise God. Glory, hallelujah. Turn with me to 1 John or 1 John 1, 9, 10 and 2, 1 and 2. That's 1 John 1, 9 and 10 and 2, 1 and 2. And it reads, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That was 1 John 1, 9 and 10 and 2, 1 and 2. And the word is blessed all by itself. It does not need our help. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this word on today. Open up our hearts and our minds. Let us receive an understanding as we hear what thus says the Lord on today. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you. Amen. The word advocate means lawyer or one who pleads our cause or case. When the believer is tempted and Satan gains mastery over him, the believer can claim the promise of 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. The Apostle John went on to say, My little children, man put the artifactual divisions between these chapters. John did not write in chapters and verses like this. Therefore, reading the four verses, of our text in sequence, we can see that John was not writing to sinners. He was writing to Christians. And for all those Christians who think they're above the law, John was writing to them. Amen? Not you, because you don't sin. We know that, right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. First John 1 and 9 often is quoted to sinners telling them to confess their sins. God didn't tell them to. It would be impossible for a sinner to confess every wrong he had ever done because his whole life is wrong. No, this verse was written to Christians. John writes, My little children, because they were saved under his ministry and were his spiritual children like you guys on this online sermon I believe to be my spiritual children these things write I unto you that ye sin not and if any man sin we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous this brings us to a very sensitive subject in the church world. Instead of staying with what the Bible says, some groups divide into theological circles or cliches that accept certain concepts, whether they are scriptural or not. It seems that the church world as a whole is divided into two groups, the Calvinists and the Arminians. In the 16th century, John Calvin and Jack Cuthbus, Arminius, attended the same institute of learning, but each came out with a different idea. One result is what we call old school Calvinism, which embraced predestination or what is to be, will be. What is to be, will be. That's like Eli. During the time of the famed evangelist Charles Finney, and I don't know if you remember him, 
if you heard about him, the minister of that day had been taught Calvinism in the Yale School of Divinity. They believed that if you were predestined to be saved, you would be saved. If you were not predestined to be saved, there was nothing you could do about it. Hmm. You could join the church and take advantage of its benefits, but God would save you only if it was his will. Finney was a lawyer. After he finished his education, he began to practice law with a former judge. The judge suggested that Finney join a church because it would help him with his business and social contact. Finney did so. In one of the young people's services, he asked them to pray for him because he realized he was unsaved and did not know God. The group was astonished as his, at his request, telling him that if he were predestined to be saved, he would be. Otherwise, he would be Lord. Finney began to read his Bible. The more he read, the more he was convinced that he could be saved. And everyone else could too, if they wanted to be. Alone, he sought God and was born again. He soon became a minister and preached that when, when God said in his word, repent, he meant you could do it. The Calvinist preached that you could not repent unless God gave you repenting, gave you a repenting heart, that you were totally incapable of doing anything yourself. Finney preached that if God asked you to do something you couldn't do, then he would be an unjust God. But God is not unjust. And when he said believe, he meant you can believe. The Calvinists, however, felt you could not believe unless God gave you a believing heart. Today, there are not too many old school Calvinists. Their doctrine has been watered down. But now they are New School Calvinists. New School Calvinism is basically the doctrine of eternal security or once saved, always saved. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I believe in eternal security as long as you stay in Christ. He is able to keep you secure. But just because you are a son of God does not mean you are not a free moral agent. You still have a will of your own and you can choose to stay in Christ or to forsake Christ altogether. The Arminian side is not correct either. They think that when you commit the smallest sin, you are immediately lost and need to be saved all over again. Arminians have the idea that God is like a fellow with a fly swatter, just waiting for a fly to light so he can swat it. They think God is waiting for his children to make just one mistake, and when they do, he is going to swat them. Oh my God. One man said he believed that if he were to speak harshly to his wife, he would be lost and bound for hell. He believed he would have to get saved all over again. If that was true, there are some people who have been saved 2,000 or 3,000 times by now. Then there are those who believe that God expects us to live above sin. Now, they believe in going on to perfection. I do too, but I haven't arrived there yet. And some people feel that we shouldn't say we haven't arrived there yet. Yet, I must be truthful. I know I haven't arrived there yet. If we already were perfect, we would not have anything to go on to. That's just like when you find elderly people on the job. They're past 67 and yet and still they're still working. And you're trying to find out 
well, why don't you retire already? But what we don't know is the fact that they have nothing to do if they retire. They have gotten so used to coming to work and socializing with their peers on the job that if they stop coming to work, they would just shrivel up and wait to die. Amen? So Paul says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Philippians 3 and 3.13. When you teach about this subject, someone always believes you are giving people a license to sin. I always say, however, that people do enough sinning without a license. Amen? It is quite obvious that God does not want us to sin. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. 1 John 2 and 1. It is quite obvious that if we walk completely in the word and in love, we wouldn't sin. But it is also obvious that none of us have achieved this yet. Considering the other side of the question, there are those who, whose Christian conversion I doubt. I doubt that they were ever Christian. Why? Because they have been taught a degree of Calvinism. They live any way they like and do anything they like. They cheat, they lie, they steal, and they fornicate. Some have said to me, it doesn't make any difference what I do. Christ is my advocate. One man said, I don't know, but what I might steal a mule next week. I am not planning to do it, but if I do, Jesus already has forgiven me for it. I doubt seriously if a fellow like that was ever saved. This scripture in John never was intended to encourage people to sin. John is simply telling us about God's provision for sin. Yes, there is a provision for sin. The Spirit of God will help us overcome sin, not encourage us to practice it. After all, John said, These things write I unto you, that you sin not. In the first place, if a man is born again, if he knows God, he doesn't want to do wrong. But often the devil tempts him through his flesh and overcomes him because he is not strong spiritually. Paul said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thy also be tempted. Galatians 6 and 1. So we're supposed to help our brother and sister be restored in meekness, not meanness, not anger, not yelling, not screaming. If it were just a thought Paul was talking about, we all would need restoring and there wouldn't be any spiritual people left to do the restoring. We all have flaws. The Greek actually says, if any man among you be overtaken in an offense or sin, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. God wants his people to be restored to full fellowship with him. It is a different matter, however, when people do not want to be restored. If they want to be restored, it is our obligation to restore them in a spirit of meekness. <coughs> Excuse me. Not arrogant. Why? Considering thyself, least thou also be tempted, Paul said. When it comes to healing, James 5, 14-15 says, if any man sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
and the prayers of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. We see here the possibility of sin. If a man were to speak sharply to his wife, he is not lost because of it. He is, however, out of fellowship with his wife. He needs to get back in fellowship with her. He needs to apologize and ask her forgiveness. And then, most of the time, that's all you need to do is apologize and ask for forgiveness. A woman loves her man, her husband, and her heart is open to receive reconciliation no matter what the cost is. But most men harden their heart and refuse to apologize. And this is what separates husband and wife. Amen. And you have some women who will do the same. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If we sin, we lose the sense of righteousness and cannot enter God's presence. Righteousness means right standing with God. Righteousness means the ability to stand in the presence of God without an inferiority complex, without a conscience of sin, without feeling less confident that we belong to God. If you have sinned or failed, you cannot stand in the presence of God without a consciousness of sin. But there is one who can go in on your behalf. Jesus Christ, the righteous, he is the propitiation, the substitute for our sin. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. As an advocate, Jesus restores us our lost sense of righteousness, for he said, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But he does more than just forgive us our sin. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses us from that sin consciousness or spiritual inferiority complex that would keep us from coming to God. There are those who live under a cloud of fear. They say things like, I am so afraid of displeasing the Lord. If Jesus comes, I might not make it. Have you ever felt that way? I have. I don't know if I am ready or not. And they are robbed of their joy in Christ. They are afraid that God is mad at them and will not have anything to do with them. And that is not so. We do not have to live under such a cloud of fear and gloominess. We can know that if we have failed, if we are Christian, our hearts will be grieved about it. Yes. If you can keep on sinning and failing, however, and are not grieved about it, you had better check out on your Christian experience. If you have been born again, and have the life and nature of God in you, you don't want to do wrong. Many times, new Christians miss God's will and sin in ways that they are not even aware of, but they are walking in the light they do have. And an example of this would be um, two couples that live together. They both are invited to church, they come to church, they give their life to Christ, and yet they're still living together and not legally married. Amen? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 and 7. As I look back now, after half a century of being a Christian, I can see that I missed God many times when I didn't even know it. At the time, I walked in what light I had, 
and the blood of Jesus cleansed me from things I didn't know about. I can remember the first time I was conscious of the fact I had done wrong after I became a Christian. It nearly broke my heart. And this is what happened when a pastor gives a newbie a revelation and they're not ready for it. The pastor is responsible for giving a new convert information that they're not ready for because it can send the new convert somewhere else. It, you know, I'm going to use homosexuality. If we tell a new convert who is a homosexual that God hate homosexuality that could break their heart and lead them out the church forever and that is not what we are supposed to do we're supposed to give them the information and the truth yes but they are to know that they're still to keep coming back because it's God's grace and mercy that will deliver them out of that lifestyle. Amen. If a believer is tempted and Satan gains mastery over him on something, when the believer cries out for mercy, he can hear Christ whisper. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what God tells us. Amen. Through the Holy Spirit, he speaks. And then we also can hear him say in this marvelous scripture from Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy. It is mercy we need when we have sinned. And I'll say that again. It is mercy we need when we have sinned. Notice God works with our needs, not our desires, but our needs. As long as we are doing right, we can get by on justice. In Hebrews 4.14 we read, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, we have a high priest who also stands in this office of advocate, that we may come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And as you look at this video, you see Jesus Christ sitting on the throne and you see the Father standing at his right hand. Amen. Grace is unmerited favor. When you fail, is the time you need grace. That's when you need mercy. Once while driving through a little town, a minister friend of mine drove through a red light. Before he knew it, there was a flashing red light behind him and the second of a shrill siren. A policeman pulled him over and gave him a ticket for running a red light and for going 45 in a 30 mile per hour zone. When the minister had to appear in court, his case was stated and the judge asked if he had anything to say. He answered, yes I do. He explained that he was on his way to preach, that he ministered in little country churches. Then he said, judge, I don't have a dime. I'll just have to go to jail or work it out on the country farm. I'm not going to ask for justice. I would be in trouble if I got justice because I'm guilty. So I am asking instead for mercy. His, con his continued, he continued, I'm like a woman in the Bible 
who was taken in the act of adultery. Her accusers brought her to Jesus, and he said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. He stooped down to write something in the sand, and when he looked up, everyone was gone. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thy accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. John 8, 7-11 The preacher added, I am asking for mercy, and I'll go and sin no more. The judge asked, Is that story in the Bible? Yes, the preacher answered. The judge said, I wish you would show it to me. The preacher had his New Testament with him, so he turned to that passage and showed it to the judge. That just shows us we are to carry our Bibles with us every place we go. Amen. The judge said, I teach a Sunday school class in the Methodist church, but I didn't know that was in there. I'm going to teach on that case the Smith. You see, the story of the adulterous woman we have been discussing, and we're going to be doing a lot of discussing about that adulterous woman story because there's so many opportunities and different scenarios that we can use with that one story. And that's what's so important about all the stories that Jesus are in and that he talked about. They have so many different meanings. They hit every walk of our lives. Amen. And we should never feel that, oh, I don't want to hear that story again. Because you don't know the outcome of where that adulterous woman's story is going to lead you. Amen. The judge showed mercy. If the preacher hadn't been speeding and hadn't run that light, he would have gotten by on justice. He wouldn't have needed mercy, but he broke the law and therefore needed mercy. Mercy and grace are always available to us when we break God's law. And we need to do is call on Christ, our advocate. All we need to do is call on Christ, our advocate. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this message on today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for letting us know that we need to repent. Even as Christians, we fall short of your grace and your desire for us. And you are a forgiving God. We thank you for forgiving us, Lord. We thank you for the peace of Jerusalem. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, and amen.